Hello, thanks for joining us. My name is River Kerstetter, and I'm here today with my colleague Matt Wilson. Hello, everybody. And we are from the Chicago Center for Arts and Technology. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about what we do at SHICAT, as well as what's going on right now at SHICAT this week, this month, and some things to look forward to in 2020 at SHICAT. Yes. Yes. So if you've never heard of us, SHICAT is a nonprofit. We are based it, uh, just north of Pilsen, just south of the medical district. We're, on, we're near Ashland and Roosevelt. Correct. Um, and our mission is to provide high quality after school art and technology programs for youth. Um, and that is the program that both me and Matt teach in. And we also have a fantastic adult education program that does no cost um, career readiness programs. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about our youth programs and uh, as well as a show that we have coming up and then we're going to talk about some things coming up in the future. Very exciting events coming up here at SciCat. We hope to see you all attending them as they come down <coughs> the pipeline. Yeah. So just Briefly, I, um, about our youth program, like I said, we provide after-school programs. We also do day programs in the summer. And we have three um, classrooms that we teach in. I teach in our uh, design studio, which does traditional art, so drawing, painting, printmaking, screen printing, um, any art form that uh, requires a lot of hands-on stuff. Uh, not that other art forms aren't hands-on, but um, yeah. we're doing that kind of art in my lab. And then, Matt, I'll let you talk about your lab. In the Maker Lab, I teach people how to use new softwares to create artwork using contemporary media. Sometimes people are programming digital art or video games. Sometimes people are working with virtual reality headsets, 3D modeling, digital sculpting, etc. A whole bunch of new school stuff that seems like it's all from the future. And it's all a fun time to make a lab, as it is with all of our studios. Yeah. And then we have a third um, studio, our digital studio. And um, in that classroom, uh, our colleagues teach arts that um, focus on photography, videography, uh, music, recording. Some um, of the more well-known, more mm -hmm. uh, commonly used art making practices mm -hmm. are in there. So yeah. if you're interested in anything related to photography, videography, graphic design, music, any part of the music pipeline, uh, photojournalism, podcasting, mm -hmm. uh, digital illustration, that's all available inside the digital lab. Yeah. And I, I think you're right, Matt. All three of our studios are a lot of fun. Or at um, least we make them as fun as we can. We do our best. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit about Shy Cat. And um, something exciting happening this week is on Friday, we have the opening of a photography show. Woo! Yeah. Um, and this is in conjunction with a um, talk by uh, the Chicago photographer Lee Bay. Lee Bay is... Um, He's from Chicago. He just came out with a new book of um, photography. Of and Southern Exposure. Yeah, that's right. So it's about the uh, forgotten architecture of the South Side. The South Side has experienced a lot of blight. It's experienced a shift in population and depopulation. So there's a lot of things that used to be in circulation or in use that have flip-flopped on which side that they are on throughout the exist time throughout the timeline of their existence. Mm -hmm. So that's what the book is. It's reminding people what exists, uh, what the South Side's architectural vernacular is, and getting people to be more interested and willing to explore the South Side. Yeah. And so we're really excited to uh, have Lee visit Shy Cat. Um, he's going to be in, um, talk about his work, be in conversation with some students of ours, um, and it's going to be a celebration. It's also going to be the opening of, like I said, a photography show. Um, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about the show that we put together? The photography show is cur it's curated by the digital instructor BJ and their assistant instructor Julius, who are currently not on air with us. But the works displayed in the show are of architecture in North Lawndale. The reason why is because we service students from that area. We service students 
primarily our three hot spots would be Pilsen, Little Village, and North Lawndale. But this specific work, the specific works in the show are specifically for North Lawndale because it doesn't get as much light as Pilsen and Little, Little Village. Not to say that Pilsen and Little Village don't need exposure. They also would benefit from any exposure they can get. They have great things going on. But we decided specifically to focus on the least commonly represented out of the three. And I think it does display a lot of things that people are not aware exist. It's a great body of photography. I encourage everyone to come on out to Cat December 6th. You'll be able to see this art show in the gallery. Do you remember what time our opening is? The time, the Lee Bay talk is supposed to be 6 to 6.30, and then afterwards there's supposed to be a gallery walk. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that the whole entire day we're going to have the artwork up. Yeah. And then people should be able to meander on, experience photography at their leisure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the that's the outlook now. Yeah, uh, who knows the roller coaster between here and Friday? <laughs> Such a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting, and um, if you can't make our opening on Friday, you can always um, come during business hours. The this work should be up um, for about two weeks um, until our. Or maybe just one week. It's actually, here's a curveball. <laughs> so after this event, we, SciCAD is host to a variety of external groups and events that take place. Following this event, we are going to be getting ready for the art show for the students we currently have enrolled. So it's only going to be up for a few days before we start to transition yeah. to the artwork. So the a few, a few days yes. the following week. But the event this Friday, um, should be really um, enjoyable, and um, we'll get to be in conversation with a local artist, which is a really great opportunity for us and our our students. So, yeah. and to add on to that, one of our students will be helping host the panel that will be between. Uh, one of the board members involved with SciCat, the student who has been taking classes with us for some time, and then the artist Lee Bay. So there will be discussion between art making practices, outlooks on creativity, arts education, uh, Chicago and its various sides and the people who make them up, as well as the photography itself. Mm -hmm. So a uh, very engaging dialogue mm -hmm. that will be able to hit on a variety of points. Yeah, and I don't know if you mentioned this, but the the photos in the, our show are made up of photos taken by uh, Shekat faculty, uh, including us, as well as um, a student of ours, um, the same student that you just mentioned. So um, basically, we uh, went out into Lawndale and um, photographed the architecture and then did some research on kind of the history of Lawndale, um, how, its, how its population has changed over the years, what has influenced its architecture, mm -hmm. um, which has been really interesting um, to learn about, and it's going to be interesting to to talk more with um, with Lee Bay and our students about. So overall, the night is supposed to be catered towards getting people exposed to things that they may or may not be familiar with, depending on what part of Chicago they frequent. The work that we have put in is meant to bring forth forms of architecture that aren't necessarily common around Chicago because the variety of buildings that we've hit have different uses, different people, and also just different styles and feels. Some of them are more for exposing the texture of the architecture that makes up Lawndale. Some of it's more for the overall feel of how does this building fit into its environment? Mm -hmm. How do the buildings change over time? So there's a lot of cultural context as well as <coughs> Uh, time-based context that's going to influence what you experience with the artwork. Yeah, and I just thinking about kind of what I what we learned in in the process of putting this show together. Um, one of the things that we learned was that before Lawndale was primarily an African American community, mm -hmm. um, a lot of um, Jewish immigrants and their descendants lived in North Lawndale. So. Uh, and that shows up a lot in the architecture. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, buildings that used to be synagogues and are now other things like schools and churches, and you can see kind of the layers um, of that history in the architecture. Layers is a good way to put it, how people have contributed to the feel of things over time. It's mm -hmm. a good way to put it. Yeah. I also learned that Martin Luther King 
lived in North Lawndale for a time, a brief period um, when he was living in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Are the, what are some of the things that you n either knew or learned about during this process about Lawndale? I'm primarily a South Sider, so I had yeah. no knowledge of the West Side. I'm just not cool <laughs> enough to know about the West Side. But the most important things that I've learned is that a lot of the graystone architecture that I'm used to seeing in condos, low-rise buildings throughout the South Side, the West Side has its own take on it. There's more detail in the work above doorways, windows, entryways that exist here, but then there's also experimenting with the surfaces in the graystone. So Chicago's bricks are famous because there's a certain type of mixture of minerals and deposits within the soil that makes up the city. So during the late 1800s into the early 1900s when brick building was like huge in response to the Chicago fire. The average Chicago brick looked different from any other brick that was fired up here. Mm -hmm. So there's just inconsistency in all these textures that you get. But the way that the material was experimented with on the south side is done to, I mean on the west side, is done to a greater degree than what I've seen on the south side in my experience. So that was, yeah. it was interesting for me to get into the to get up close to the architecture that makes this west side function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So, um, Matt, so thinking about this show, you know, we, you, like you mentioned, you know, part of why we chose to uh, photograph and learn about Lawndale was um, kind of an underrepresentation of that mm -hmm. area that we saw. Um, so speaking of representation in art, um, I want I would be curious to hear some of your thoughts on that, and maybe to start us off, like um, what has one of what was one of the first times that you kind of felt like you were represented in art? Awesome question. Yeah. I primarily make three D models and renderings illustrations and then some animation and some data visualization but those those are like my four things and historically a lot of those things are based on technology excluding the analog illustration and a lot of technology doesn't actually come from black neighborhoods or the black art bubble so in my experience people had always tried to push me into doing more uh, traditional analog media and they've always tried to put me into like the black bubble, like I have to make artwork focusing on uh, slavery, the African American diaspora, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Although that does influence some of my personal artwork, that's not all that I look for. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking for artwork throughout the time I was little until I was in college, really, I hadn't really seen a lot of artwork. But then I started to experiment with going to different galleries. And I think one of the first big artists that I saw in real life was uh, Kehinde Wiley's paintings in the Minneapolis, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the art center in there, it's a big gray building with the cherry in the field across. But uh, Kehinde Wiley was really one of the first black artists that I had seen that made me question more about the art making process. Mm -hmm. And uh, double on to Kehinde Wiley for also being LGBT and then also African American working with taking African-American subjects and putting them into paintings influenced by art greats from XYZ years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's a, that, that really made me want to learn more and want to make more. So that was my first time seeing it. Cool. And you, when, when was the first time you felt represented in yeah. the theater? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I grew up in New Mexico, uh, in central New Mexico, and I'm indigenous, but I'm not indigenous to New Mexico. So I grew up around actually a lot of indigenous art. Okay. Um, not always uh, indigenous art that was like from my, you know, uh, tribal nation. Um, but I was lucky. I, I grew up a around a lot of indigenous art, a lot of indigenous people. Um, however, I'm also queer. And there, I did not, growing up, I didn't see as much representation of queer queerness in indigenous art. Particularly in New Mexico, there's um, a certain kind of kind of commercialized oh, indigenous art okay. um, that is, you know, sold to collectors and, and tourists and, and anyone, you know, and it's not necessarily better or worse, but it's definitely not necessarily 
um, about kind of it's not as political maybe huh. um, so so all of that in mind I think I started to see more art that I felt like I saw queerness and indigeneity in when I actually moved to Chicago um, there are a lot of indigenous folks in the city a lot of indigenous artists and of course a huge queer community um, so I started to see um, more when I moved here about five years ago um, and I'm trying to think I think was there a specific artist yeah so uh, Demian Dene Yazi um, is a Dene artist uh, they're queer and they do a lot of work talking about um, how the HIV epidemic affects oh, not only okay. queer communities but also indigenous communities and he had a work in a show a couple years ago at um, DePaul and that was one of the first times that I really could see like someone that I could relate to so much. Did and that, you meet this person since they're um, working in Chicago? I've not met them. I've um, I've like spoken to them via the internet. Um, so we follow each other on Slide Instagram. Slide in DMs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and like that kind of like you said, like that the time you were recalling kind of made you want to learn more and make more. I definitely think the more I saw like people like me, not not just Demian, but other indigenous people, other femmes, other queer people, I was like, okay, this is, there's no reason I can't also be an artist or, and talking about my experiences, so. That's a great way to put it. So pretty much, I know for me, when I make work, whether I'm programming something or whether I'm digital sculpting or drawing, there's a discussion I'm having in my head about why I'm making it. So I question a lot of where do I stand within the greater discussion about people who align with my identity? Where do I stand with where my art falls in the art sphere? Mm -hmm. Am I contributing to creativity? Am I not contributing? Am I helping or hurting future artists that might see my work? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have those discussions with yourself while making artwork, but that's a lot of what goes into yeah, it. So it's, lot, it's nice to see other people mm -hmm. who probably have had the same discussions with themselves while they were making artwork. Yeah. I think the internet makes it so that I we can't actually think, like, okay, if people like me are not necessarily living or going to see this, like, in a show, they can see it on the internet, right? So I do think about that, like, how do I, how do I get my work out to people like me or people who need to see it maybe mm -hmm. um, so yeah and I and I think too um, and I think all of us at Shycat think about this but um, you know we grew up seeing I, I imagine for you too a lot of white dead male artists yeah and I think there's there's a lot of educators who are trying to shift that narrative and we're trying to do that as well so I think about that in at Shycat is like if I'm going to be teaching a little bit of art history, you know, try to make it diverse, you know, yeah. and, and not necessarily ignore the the so-called canon, but to enrich it with, like, other people so that our students can see themselves represented more. Yeah, there's a lot of... Whenever I introduce artists to students, I kind of jump into the work first, and once they get a feel for the work, we can zoom back out to, like, the person. Mm -hmm. But that's just the way that I teach it. Other people go in different ways. So. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Always interesting. Um, so before we uh, wrap up here, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our youth programs that um, we have coming up in the spring. Yep. So um, just a reminder, and for anyone who has just joined us um, at ShyCat, we provide no cost um, after school and summer uh, art and technology programs for yep. youth. We serve grades six all the way up through 12. Um, and, you know, we're wrapping up our fall classes, but um, starting in February of 2020, uh, we're going to have some new classes. So, um, Matt, what are your classes that you're offering this spring? Great, great segue. For the spring, I'm shifting the Maker Lab from focusing more on the uh, 3D modeling side 
3D printing side to the electronics and robotics side. So for the middle schoolers, in the middle school classes will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 4.30 to 6.30. Students will be able to come in and get no-cost programming in a class named Pixel. Pixel will teach students to use Arduino and JavaScript to make digital artworks via coding, which is, they're just JavaScript libraries, and they'll be experimenting with a little bit of electronics, a little bit of robotics, and also making digital art. So it's much more towards the STEM side of STEAM. Mm -hmm. And then the high schoolers, which will have class from 5 to 7 p.m. Tuesday, Thursday, is the name of that class is high voltage so students will be able to come in to learn the basics of electronics and transition from the basics to finishing the class with making a wearable electronic piece of artwork so there'll be much there will be much technical jargon being thrown around but at the end of it they'll have some work that's sound technically but also creatively awesome so in my studio which is the uh, traditional arts or design arts um, our middle school class is going to be, is called uh, Beyond the Pencil. And uh, so often people think that to be an artist you have to be good at drawing. And that's totally not true. Um, of course, some artists draw, but not all artists draw or, you know, are or good draw at drawing. Or draw in a conditional, in a traditional sense. Right, exactly. So in this class with middle schoolers, we're going to be exploring different ways of making art that don't rely on drawing. Um, we're going to do some printmaking, some um, cyanotypes, which is like a, a kind of a cross between printing and photography. Uh, we're going to do collage, abstract art, um, lots of exciting things. And then with our high schoolers, um, that class is advanced printmaking. I'm a printmaker. A uh, lot of my education is in printmaking, so um, we are going to dive into printmaking um, and no matter what skill level our students come in with, my goal will be to introduce them to a lot of different kinds of printmaking and make some really cool art. Awesome. Yeah. And in our, um, just briefly, in our digital lab, I believe, uh, that middle school class is podcasting. Mm -hmm. And then the high school class, I believe, will be uh, graphic design. Yeah, last we talked, I think it was graphic design. Um, but to learn more about any of our classes and to sign up, you can always reach us at www.shycat.org. Um, it's this website right here, green and purple. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. I hope to see some of you all at the show this Friday. If not, feel free to come to our fall art show December 20th. It's going to be 5 to 7. Mm -hmm. Go see some student artwork and hope to see you all in classes someday. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone.